a kooky old man with a love for riddles and knickknacks, an information technologist with a wild backstory, and a man who loves to play fox and geese. Welcome to the first episode of Connections, where we go on a journey of how almost every corner of the Nancy Drew universe is related one way or another. I'm your host Carter, and I'm beyond excited for this new series. It's something that I've been slowly accumulating research on over the last six months, so it's definitely been a work, but one that I believe was 100% worth it. If you know me, you know I love game theories, and I'm so excited to feature this one as the first episode. So. What are we waiting for? Let's dive into this thing. Our connection begins all the way back to the year 1930. The place, the road to Titusville, where we find Nancy Drew. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm not going to quote the entire announcer, but you guys get the point. Yes, Secret of the Old Clock, an absolute classic. It's very obvious that Josiah Crowley was an eccentric older man, and we learn all about his hobbies and random collections just from taking a look around his house and shed. And that's exactly what I want to focus on today because we never quite get an answer to some of the reasons of why these certain objects are just inside Crowley's home, but there's enough foundation to speculate. The items that stand out to me the most are these four things. The elephant, the carousel horse, the robot, and the clown pictures. All four of these items are connected and give us a huge idea of maybe what Josiah Crowley's past looks like. But before we go into how they were connected, I would just like to mention Josiah had the most diverse list of interests ever. He was a very wealthy man that was into everything. Music, acting, philosophy, riddles, fishing, and mini golf. His talent was pretty endless, but before he was wealthy, what if he wasn't? Josiah Crowley was born in, my guess, 1865 or maybe a little later. This would make him around his late 60s when he passed away, about 64 years old in 1929. His family was very poor and he stayed with them for as long as he could, until his early 30s. But he had to move out to better support his family as poverty was worsening in this area. So Josiah took the advice of his friend and moved to a bigger city whose population was steadily increasing and jobs were easier to find. New Jersey. But when he got there, it was so much tougher than he imagined, and after a few years of struggling back and forth, Josiah ended up losing everything and he became homeless. And despite losing it all, Josiah still remained fairly upbeat about life and refocused his goal to getting back to his parents and finding a job back home. Over the course of the next year, he made several attempts to leave, but all were too costly, so he ended up settling in New Jersey for a while. Josiah made several friends in the homeless communities who taught him so many life lessons that he would never forget. But the most important thing they taught him, use what you have, stay positive even when things look difficult. And one day, roaming the streets looking for a place to sleep, Josiah stumbled upon a ginormous tent with a loud, rolling sound of a crowd coming from the inside. Crowley peeked through one of the openings, a circus. He watched a bit of the performance and the glow of the inside show painted his face with joy. He had an idea. Pacing around the outside of the tent, he came up with a plan. Join the circus. It was the only way that he could get back on his feet. So he waited outside the performer's area and as soon as the performers came out of the tent, he pestered the workers for a chance to show him his clown act. So remembering his friend's advice, he used what he had and performed an entire hobo clown act, something that didn't exist in circuses at the time. After he finished, the performers were so blown away and laughed at all of his jokes that he was hired on the spot. So Josiah ended up becoming a hobo clown, the first one in the US and a trend that would continue to be used in circuses around the country. This also gave Josiah an opportunity to give his friends a shot at joining too, and soon they did, performing in the same acts as Josiah. And now, fast forward seven years, Josiah had become the partner of Herman and Crowley's circus. On the last night of a show in New Jersey, Herman never showed, which was very unlike him. The performers later checked on him after the show and found that he was sick at home with pneumonia. He would die just two weeks later, leaving Josiah Crowley as the remaining owner of the Herman and Crowley Circus. The year was 1905. The team was so saddened by the news and later split over the loss. 
Over the next few years, several potential buyers tried to bargain with Crowley for the location where the circus once sat. It was a widely successful and popular event spot, but Crowley wanted to ensure it was sold to an individual who would keep the family fun theme alive. And it wasn't until he met Sheldon Rousseau in 1912 that he knew he found the perfect candidate. Rousseau's idea was to create a ballroom, but what Crowley loved the most was his idea for a carousel. The plan was to call it Captain's Cove, and Crowley was enthused by the swell notion of having such a joyous event place for all to have fun. There was only one stipulation on Crowley's end, however. The only person that Josiah Crowley wanted to create the art for the carousel was a man that he had heard of in a local New Jersey newspaper that had just finished designing his first carousel, and that man was Rolf Kessler. Crowley was fascinated with his eccentric artistic abilities and was so fascinated by his realistic carvings, he wanted to make sure that Sheldon Rousseau used Rolf Kessler for this carousel. And so, with an agreement, the lot was sold to Sheldon Rousseau and Kessler would soon hear from Rousseau for his second carousel project in 1913. Packing up his old life, Crowley returned to his hometown, visiting friends like the local banker Jim Archer and Gloria Crandall, who had just welcomed a new baby, Emily. He enjoyed a life of retirement, doing the things he loved, being around the people he loved, and he often made returns to Captain's Cove. In fact, Crowley loved the carousel and Kessler's expressive artistic abilities so much that he ended up purchasing one of the horses from Sheldon. He loved it so much that he directly placed it into his home with the rest of his circus memories. The clown picture, the elephant statue, all from his days at the circus. This explains what all these items have to do with Josiah, why he knows the hobo sign language, and why he incorporated it into his final puzzle for his real will. Because he used to be homeless himself. He joined the circus and eventually became the owner and sold it to Rousseau, who would later build the Captain's Cove Amusement Park. All right, so that was our very first connection of this first episode. We'll be taking a short commercial break and we'll be back. Are people always asking you to do their chores? Yeah. Do you find yourself having a hard time saying no? Yeah. Then you need the Lulu Talk Back Parrot. <laughs> Specially designed with Krollmeister speakers, this Lulu Talkback Parrot will do all the talking for you. No more clam hunting or a dozen little critter hunting, no, no, no. With this brand new technology, all you have to do is press the button and a creative response is all lined out for you. Check it out! Music to my ears. First thing you can do for me is go out to the garden and pick all the ripe vegetables. No chores, no chores for shorty. The only thing that's going to be picked up is your smile off the floor when you realize I'm not going to do anything you say. Wow, isn't that amazing? Call today for your Lulu Talkback Parrot and you can get a second one for free. Call the number below. And we're back. I'm going to have to give me one of those Lulu Talkback Parrots. I don't know about you guys, but... Woo, that last connection blew my mind, but it only gets crazier from here, and I'm excited to share with you guys. So, I know you're probably thinking, Carter, how in the world does Antonio Fongo play into this entire thing? Well, the connection actually revealed to me when I recently rewatched a stream of this game. Nancy breaks into Fongo's office with one of her bobby pins. She's only in there for a few seconds, and all of a sudden, the pager starts beeping. And she's frantically looking around for a place to hide. She notices there's a tall filing cabinet. She runs over, hides in the filing cabinet. Fongo goes in. He shuffles around a few papers. He notices that the filing cabinet door is slightly cracked open. So he goes over and tries to close it, sips some coffee nearby, and never notices Nancy. She's inches away from him, but she's safe, hidden in the filing cabinet. He finally leaves. Whew, big relief. But... When Nancy actually begins to explore a little bit of his office, I love when she does that. You know, especially with characters like Fongo because we never really get to talk to him. So this is our time to learn more about him and his life and his personality. So something to note that Fongo has in his office in relation to this video is he has in his filing cabinets the exact same robot as Crowley. Same type of deal. It looks like a replica souvenir type thing 
um, of, of the much bigger original one in Crowley's home. And this prompted myself to ask, why? Why does Fongo have souvenirs of this? And thus came the connection. So we know that once Nancy finds Crowley's real will, the story ends with everyone getting their fair share of the promised money. Emily Crandall with enough to help keep the lilac in alive, and Jim Archer with enough to prevent the closure of the bank. But I believe there may be more development of this story than just that. I mean, this is a big story. Not something I think would just be town talk, but maybe even national talk. And as the story continued to unfold and be shared, I'm certain that more people wanted answers to who was Josiah Crowley. It's never explicitly stated in the game, but I feel like Crowley may have written off his estate to the Crandalls, which would be logical since the Lilac Inn is in close proximity, and I also like this idea because I can totally see Emily maybe using some of Crowley's trinkets and knickknacks as decorations for the inn. Low-key getting a Cracker Barrel vibe here, you guys. And so, with more investigation from news outlets and permission from Emily, they sat down and interviewed what she knew about Crowley, asking to tour his house and see his possessions to better understand and get to know who he was. And the more the news uncovered details of his life, the more interested people became, especially with Josiah's intricate and well-designed contraptions. I mean, can you imagine the amount of shock everyone must have had when they saw his shed? Man had some pretty intense machinery that he created for the 1920s. Actually, this is all backed up when we look through Josiah's scratch notes in his home. In the Putting Physics to Work in the Modern World book sitting on his table, the book details a way to use a radiometer measuring heat and light to create some sort of energy to be used. However, the book discredits the theory, and Crowley crosses through several lines noting, that's what you think depends on what you do with the light first, pea brain. And this gives substantial evidence that not only was Josiah diverse in his interests, eccentric and artful, but also wildly brilliant and intelligent to comprehend deep theories. And this interest is also confirmed when we read his other notebook, Lest I Forget, where he sketches a coil with electric beams noting, Tesla coil invented in 1891 by Nikola Tesla. Fascinating. Wait, where have we heard this name before? <coughs> Deadly device. <coughs> Anyways, back to the story. I can absolutely see the public being fixated and fascinated with the mysteriousness of Crowley and may even petition to see his work be put on display. I mean, there's definitely more to his home than what we see, so who knows? Maybe he has more inventions sitting out in the back that never saw public eye. Actually, just based off of what he built in his shed, I speculate that Crowley possibly built the robot that's proudly displayed in his home himself. This technology was very alive at the time, and even Tesla himself was working with wireless control devices in 1898 according to a wiki search on the term robots, which would make sense for Crowley if he continued to follow Tesla and his inventions throughout life, and it's very possible seeing his interest in the physics and theories of electricity and energy as noted in his notes and books. And if some of his thoughts and works make it into the public, I feel like Josiah Crowley would become a well-known name in the future. Okay, okay. We now know how the robot is connected to Josiah, but where am I going? Where is Fongo linked into this? So just basing this off the information we learn in Fongo's office, we know that this guy has some degrees. Plural. He obtained his master's in computer science in 2003 and finished his bachelor's degree in 2000 in digital data storage and transfer. But before that, what was Fongo doing? Well, he actually went to a school in 1993 but was kicked out for cheating. And when I first saw the name of this school, I had to look it up because I wasn't sure exactly what the name meant. The first name was called Polytechnico, which means technical in Italian. So the full name of the school was Polytechnico, or technical, Tesla. Oh, wait a minute, my brain said, Tesla? Man, this guy is everywhere. But my point to this explanation is that Fongo is obviously intertwined in the science and technology community. 
I believe that he has probably learned about Tesla and studied his theories, even William Cook's theories and opinions, the guy that wrote the radio meter book in Crowley's home. I feel like a man like Fongo is well versed in the studies of these people, and if it's true, if Crowley's work really did become available to the public and the fame of his name continued to grow, I can see Crowley being featured in those same conversations of his schooling. That Crowley's scratch notes with possible designs, theories, and inventions continued to be studied decades after his death. Crowley's work was probably put in a museum to display to the world, along with work from other brilliant people around the world. And in my head, I envision Fungal totally engrossing himself into these subjects and learning everything he can, later using his knowledge for crying, but still soaking in all the information. There are a couple of different ways I could see Fongo obtaining this robot in his possession. One, maybe he visited the museum where Crowley's work was put on display, and Fongo was so fascinated with Josiah's creations, particularly the robot he created, that he purchased a replica souvenir from the gift shop at the museum. Or two, maybe Fongo and his friends were totally into robotics as teenagers and they built a replica of Crowley's famous robot themselves. Either way, Fongo possesses a Crowley robot, and somehow, past and present lives intertwined in some way. It's crazy to think about connections in life like that and all the what-ifs. Who knows what person from past history we may be connected to, and how our lives are intertwining right this very second. It's honestly a crazy thought continuum that sends my brains in loops, <laughs> and if I keep thinking about it, I'm gonna get dizzy. <laughs> So, we'll be getting to the last bit of this episode in just a minute, right after this short commercial break. Ten girls, one school, a snack shop, boyfriend stealing, and a squirrel. This can only be one show. Warnings at Waverly. Find out what happens on this week's episode. Here's a sneak peek. So I'm sitting with my best scout pals in the library doing my homework and in walks Mel and she has completely changed her hair color and it's way more atrocious than what it already was. I was completely appalled and could not believe I was standing in her presence. So I got new hair and now everyone's freaking out about it. Whatever. Are there cookies backstage? Oh, does my hair, does it look fine in this angle? Okay, um, so tell me again why I have to be here at the snack shop. Yeah, I, I, I don't do this. Like, I, I don't really participate. Leela, stop making noise. I'm trying to film my good charity deed for the show. Sorry. <laughs> Anyways, so um, here is fine. Attention all women and students, the snack shop will be closing permanently. Find out what happens in the series of biggest season finale this Friday, 7, 8 central. <laughs> I hope you guys liked that last commercial. Uh, that was my favorite one to make. So we're gearing towards the last bit of this episode and it has been so exhilarating breaking this information down with you guys. And I think this last connection came from the first time I played this game, which was reignited in my research of this first episode. The game, The White Wolf of Icicle Creek. Thinking back to the first time I played this game, especially after Creature of Kaku Cave, I think what leaves me the most impressed is the incredibly large display of characters within the game. Not only did we have six physical characters, but several phone characters as well, probably around eight or so. And I always love when there's a lot of people to interrogate and discuss the case with. Um, another example of this is Ghost of Thorn Hall. You know, everyone is just so intertwined with each other. And that is always so fun to learn and immerse into. It gives it a much more realistic feel. But when I first played Icicle Creek, I remember learning about one specific character and instantly time traveling back to the first time I played The Haunted Carousel, which is how this connection honestly begins. Taking it back to Rolf Kessler, we gotta talk about this man's life, his story. 
We actually know a lot about him as the game summarized most of his life in a magazine that we find in Elliot's office with the headline of the cover stating, Professor Anton Sukov, an antique carousel expert, talks about the controversy behind the recommended horse carver, Rolf Kessler. So just based on the magazine's information, here's what we know. Kessler was born in Austria in 1882. The magazine describes him as a small man, connected more with animals than he did people. He moved to the U.S. when he was 21 in about 1903 in hopes of riding racehorses. His reclusive nature and poor social skills got in the way of his dream ever taking off, so he carved furniture instead, selling it on street corners. In 1907, when he was about 26 years old, he landed an apprenticeship at the Philadelphia Tobahagen Company. He lasted only a day and a half, but took everything he learned enough to carve outstanding carousels. So he began carving and eventually convinced the mayor of Samboni, New York, that the tiny town needed Kessler to carve a carousel for it and that he should be paid for it. In 1909, he married his wife, Amelia. And for the next 10 years of his life, from 1910 to 1920, Kessler carved four more carousels, two in New Jersey, one in Pennsylvania, and one in Connecticut. However, by 1921, his mood swings were so severe, and his angry insistence that his horses existed as living creatures in a parallel dimension drove his wife, Amelia, away for good. And once Kessler realized his beloved wife wasn't returning, he dropped everything to look for her. And it took him two years, until about 1923, to find her. But she had died of tuberculosis soon after him finding her. And no one knows what happened to Kessler after. He vanished from history. And that's it. Nothing. We have no more knowledge on the years after this. Now, fast forward to when I played Icicle Creek, just like all the Nancy Drew games, I insert the disc into my computer. I'm getting it all uploaded into my computer software. The game begins and the intro starts. This is my center of operations, my desk. I click on the ticket, the game begins, characters, oh my gosh, there's so many characters. There's Chantal Monique, Alan Randall, Lou Talbot, Tino Balducci, THE Tino Balducci, Guadalupe Camillo, Freddy, Bill Kessler, Elsa, the maid, the cook, oh, 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 oh. Bill Kessler? And I sat there in my silence staring at my gaming screen thinking, oh my gosh, they gotta be related. They've got to be related. So here's the deal. Bill Kessler, we only get just a very short synopsis of his life from the game. We know he's a middle-aged construction worker from Canada who loves to fish. His grandmother, Tilly Wentworth, used to own the lodge, but it was bought by Chantal's father just two years ago. And this is how I dream it. Okay, so Rolf Kessler spends two years looking for Amelia, but what happened during those two years? Possibly a baby? <laughs> so let's say Amelia is pregnant by the time she leaves Rolf, unknown to both individuals at the time. Amelia gives birth to a baby boy, William Kessler. I actually feel like Bill's grandmother married more than once. She probably separated from her husband, Abe Wentworth, kept the lodge and remarried later to William Gessler. It's possible that she kept her original married name, but her children would obtain the Kessler last name. Her grandson would be Bill Kessler. And I think this is probably um, the case because Bill happens to be a construction worker who loves to fish. I mean, could the love for carving and building as well as animals be evident in this family, you know, passed down through the years from Rolf? Because if you think about it, Amelia died. We don't know what happened to Rolf Kessler after. Did he find the child and take him in as his own? Where did they move to? Did he receive closure before Amelia's death? Did he find time to heal by raising his son? Maybe that's how the story goes. There's endless possibilities to this open book, but that's the beauty of theories and the what ifs. The moment you dream up one idea, another soon follows that's just as grand. And it really sparks an entirely new perspective on these games, their characters and their lives, the plot. And all because there may be 
a connection. G. Krollmeister plays a vital role throughout the indie universe, and in this mystery, he boards Nancy in one of the best Ryokans in Japan. Known as a traditional inn, Nancy stays in a place where she's unsure why this location has a reputation. Is it good or is it bad? She questions. Are there secrets around every corner? Yes, she comes to find out, but it's so much deeper than what she's uncovered. Could P.G. Krollmeister be playing into something much more sinister? Is the Ryokan a central location for past suspects to converse? And why? Why are these people's lives crossing paths? Join me for my next episode of Connections.